Hello, everyone, both on campus and online. I'm Dr. George Vigil, Director of Marketing and Administrative Operations within the College of Natural Sciences. I'm thrilled to have everyone join us for the College of Natural Sciences speaking engagement with Dr. Catherine C. Thornton during Women's History Month and as a part of our Sherber lecture series. At this time, I invite Dean of the College of Natural Sciences, Sastri G. Pantula to the podium. Good afternoon. Yeah, so I'm glad that you were able to fly in here with this wind uh, on the Pi Day. Um, uh, there is some Pi there too, besides brownies. So, uh, you know, it's a Pi Day, right? Today, March 14th. Um, Today it is both an honor and a privilege to introduce a remarkable individual whose stellar career has not only soared beyond the boundaries of our planet, but has also significantly contributed to the enrichment of science and education here on Earth. We are here to celebrate the incredible journey and achievements of Dr. Catherine Thornton you're in for a treat, and I don't mean the yummy brownies there. You're here to have a conversation with truly a trailblazer as we celebrate the Women's History Month. Born in Montgomery, Alabama, Dr. Thornton never dreamed of being an astronaut as a child. And my understanding is that, again, correct me if I'm wrong, this is from Chad GPT. <laughs> <laughs> so she only liked climb trees and play in the dirt. Needless to say, her curiosity led her to develop also a passion for the stars and led her to pursue a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Auburn University, followed by a Master's and a PhD in Physics from the University of Virginia. In 1984, Dr. Thornton joined NASA's Astronaut Corps, marking the beginning of what would be an extraordinary contribution to space exploration. Over her career as an astronaut, she flew on four space shuttle miss missions, STS-33, 49, 61, and 73, accumulating over 975 hours in space. Each of these missions contributed significantly to our understanding of space and demonstrated the potential of human ingenuity and determination. One of Dr. Thornton's most notable accomplishments came during the STS-61 mission, the first Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission in December, 1993. Her role in the mission was critical in correcting the Hubble's flawed vision, thereby enabling the telescope to capture the breathtaking images of the universe that have since captivated the world. The mission alone stands as a testament to human resolve and our relentless pursuit of knowledge. Beyond her contributions to the exploration of space, Dr. Thornton has been a steadfast advocate for education, particularly in STEM. After retiring from NASA in 1996, she transitioned to academia, joining the faculty of the University of Virginia. Beyond her stellar accomplishments as an astronaut and a physicist, she has been a passionate, passionate advocate for STEM education and mentorship. She has inspired countless of students, particularly young women, to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, leaving an indelible mark on the next generations of scientists and explorers. Again, she has received numerous honors and awards, including NASA's Space Flight Medal and the NASA Distinguished Service Medal. In addition to her career at NASA, she has made significant contributions to academia as a distinguished professor. Her research in astrophysics and space exploration 
has advanced our understanding of the universe and paved the way for future discoveries. She has also been involved in humanitarian efforts using her platform to raise awareness about global challenges and promote international cooperation in addressing issues such as climate change and sustainability. So let me close with one of her famous quotes from the space when a tool she was using slipped from her grasp and began floating away. With quick thinking and a touch of humor, she exclaimed over the radio, Houston, we have a problem with a screwdriver. Her ability to handle unexpected challenges with grace and wit speaks volumes about her resilience and adaptability in the face of adversity. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a true pioneer, an inspiring educator, a trailblazer, and a distinguished scientist, Dr. Catherine C. Thornton. Hello. Can we get someone to deal with the echo? It's that speaker it's right there. I hear it here too. I know we need to use the mic for Zoom, but this is really distracting. <laughs> you have to not listen to yourself. Is that better? It's getting better. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Cause I couldn't think straight with that. <laughs> it sounds like some of the audience agrees. Okay. Um, so I'm the other person up here, which some of you know and others don't. Um, so I'm faculty here at CSUSB, um, faculty in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and the Interim Associate Dean for the College of Natural Sciences. And I'll be the moderator for today's session. So um, we'll just run into some questions, have a conversation, and at the end, we'll open it up to the audience in case any of y'all have questions as well. So um, given that uh, elaborate introduction, uh, <laughs> thanks to ChatGPT, we should all ChatGPT ourselves now <laughs> and see what comes up. It's the new cool thing. Um, so uh, because of your background in, in physics, and I know this is something that uh, here locally, we talk about a lot as well. Um, it's a field that's traditionally dominated by men. Um, I, for myself, I was often the only or one of very few women in the class um, in much of my career. So how did you overcome challenges and stereotypes to become an astronaut? And what advice would you have for students facing similar obstacles? That's a, that's a good question. And it's, um, it's kind of history. I think things have changed a lot since then, but I was almost always the only girl in the physics classes. Um, then I went to NASA when astronaut office was fairly male dominated. Um, I just was one of the guys. I grew up with three brothers. I had sisters as well, but I grew up with three brothers. And you know, you guys are not that mysterious and you're not that complicated, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> um, I just think when, when, you, when a team focuses on the goal and, and welcomes and values people for what they bring to the problem, then those other things just go away. So that was kind of my approach to it. So I think one of the questions that you get asked most often um, is what was it like being in space? So what surprised you the most about living and working in space for the, the time that you did? And how did you adapt, adapt excuse me, to the unique challenges of being in microgravity? Well, there's nothing like it here on Earth, I can tell you. There are ways that we simulate it and, and every one of those lies to you in one way or another. So none of them are exact. And you get up there and the learning curve is really steep. And you get really smart after about 20 minutes. Um, you, you, um, first instinct when you unstrap from your seat is to kick and swim, because that's the closest analog that we've ever experienced to that. Will do you no good at all. So we get boots off people as fast as possible because somebody's gonna get hurt. <laughs> and, so, and, and let me, preface this with, with, I will talk about, my experience is all in the shuttle program. So I've, I um, flew between 89 and 95 before there was a space station, so I didn't have that opportunity. So I will talk about shuttle in the present tense, even though I know it's been retired, it's been gone for more than a decade, but, but I can't shake that. So I'm not crazy, I do understand that it's gone, but I, I, you, I will slip into it. 
But anyway, when we first got up there, it's a fairly small volume. So maybe, you know, twice the size of a minivan with six of your best friends and a whole bunch of other stuff in there. And so to have that many people kicking and flailing, you want to get boots off pretty quickly before somebody gets hurt. Um, you also learn pretty quickly that as hard as I push off that wall, as I coast to that wall, I'm going to hit that wall that hard. So you don't have to push hard to get over here. You just wait a little while. Other than that, you're going to smack that wall and generally ricochet off, and then you're going somewhere else. Um, there's some interesting things that happen to your body when you first get up there. Um, one is that the fluid that normally pools in the lower part of your body as you're in gravity redistributes itself because there's nothing pulling it down there anymore. And so you get this big, fat, full head feeling like you're hanging upside down instantly. When the main engine's cut off, it goes um, that takes care of itself in about 24 hours. You get rid of about a quart of fluid. So for an earthling, you're dehydrated, but for a space person, that's how you're supposed to be. The second thing has to do with the, your nerve vestibular system, your semicircular canals. They don't work without gravity. So there's a little um, otoliths in there that, that move when you bend over, when you move your head, and that tells you that you have changed orientation. So if I close my eyes and do a pitch over like this, I know that I did that because these little things are tickling the nerve endings and telling my brain, yes, I did this. The way you get that same sensation in orbit <clears throat> is to move backwards. So by inertia, the little stones trickle forward. They tell your brain you did this. Your eyeballs say, no, 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 you did this. And so that, that mismatch of signals um, I think causes your brain to shut down non-essential systems while it figures out what's going on, and one of those is your digestive system. So about 40% of the astronauts um, experience what's called space adaptation syndrome, and it's, um, it's nausea, sometimes vomiting, malaise, headache from the in increased intracranial pressure. Um, so I've been told it's like a bad hangover, but I'd have to have corroboration on that, but you know, really feeling crummy. Um, and it, for me, it resolved itself within the first day. After I got a sleep period, I felt pretty good the next day. One of the things that we would do was, uh, if we thought we were feeling better but not quite sure, is to get the stethoscope out of the medical kit and start listening for sounds. If you don't have any motion, any noises going on in your belly, don't bother to eat because <laughs> it's just going to come right back. So for some people, it took longer than one day. But that was, um, body's an amazing thing. It just adapts, you know so quickly in a day or so from this environment we've lived in our entire lives to this alien environment up there that adapts extraordinarily quickly. And you learn to, um, you, you, you expect, you expect it. Okay, we're all phys physics people know, you know, Newton's laws are alive and well, even in orbit, and they work just as well there. And so there's a lot of things you do expect, but don't really expect, you know? You, 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 um, but the ones that you don't even think about, so all the things to do with your experiment, you've thought about, okay, I have to have this hand here and this hand here and that sort of thing. But um, the things that you haven't thought about are sort of the everyday things. So on one flight, I had to deploy a satellite, my first flight, and, and the last switch, this whole panel of switches, you go through the checklist, set the switches. Pull the, I was, to deploy it, you had to pull a handle up and then move it down. So it was lever locked so you couldn't bump it or kick it and deploy when you weren't ready to. And so I also had to push a, a box strapped to my leg that keyed the mic. So I keyed the mic, and I got my hand on the switch, and I'm counting down five, four, three. I got to three before I figured out I can't do this. I need another hand to push so that I can pull. So I, I instantly decided to let go of the mic and did the deploy on time, which was the right thing to do, but it took me about half an hour to convince the ground that I had, in fact, done that. Because from their perspective, I just stopped counting at three <laughs> and went cold mic on them. So that was one of the, the things I thought, God, why didn't I think of that? I got smart pretty quickly after that. So your missions lasted anywhere from a handful of days to a couple of weeks. Was that learning, how was that learning curve coming back to Earth? And did it depend on how long you were up? Um, another good question. Um, I have no experience with six-month flights or longer, so I don't really know how that's going. But um, I think coming back was the same every time. So the things that, that change when you go to orbit have to change back to be an Earthling again. So we learned in the early program to, um, 
to get the, you have to get the fluid back in your body. So right before the deorbit burn, we would drink like a couple quarts of water and a bunch of salt tablets. The salt to hold the water in our systems long enough to get into gravity. And you had to do it at the right time because if you did it too late, you'd have quarts of salt water sloshing in your belly during entry. And if you did it too early, it would be in your diaper. <laughs> and that's not of any help either. So, and that helped, that was okay. When I got back to Earth, I didn't have um, the problems of being lightheaded when I stood up because I was dehydrated. Um, I could, I could stand forever, I could walk a straight line forever. What I couldn't do is walk and turn because the neurovestibular thing um, hasn't readapted. So over the course of however long the space flight is, even first one was five days, I think, uh, your brain figures out to ignore what your inner ear is telling it. This is lying to you, just don't believe it. And it depends solely on your eyes for, um, for your orientation. So if you close your eyes, you will fall over, absolutely fall over. And I know that because I came back from one of the flights, and it was um, it was winter time, and I had to get up the next morning and get my kids off to school. So the alarm goes off at six o'clock. It's dark. I got out of bed, turned a corner, and I went into free fall. Well, free fall is what you're doing in space. You're falling around the Earth. So I thought, great, I'm back in space. I went in the Superman cruise position and landed absolutely flat on my face on the floor. No protective movements at all. I mean, I was, I was enjoying that tenth of a second from here to here. It was pretty cool stuff. That, that um, lasts for a while. So one of the tests the docs would have us do at like 30-day checkup is to close your eyes and stand on one foot. Not that hard to do. I couldn't begin to do it, even at a month later. They do encourage us not to drive home when we get back to Houston. Uh, the next day, I was okay to drive as long as I didn't have to do a left turn. You know, or check six, because that would just tumble my gyro. So if I could make all right turns to get to my office, I was pretty okay to drive at that point. Um, but I think that that, I don't recall that changing any from a five-day flight to a 16-day flight. I think it's all the same. You have to get back into it. So um, along with those flights, you completed a number of spacewalks um, during your time up there. Can you share a memorable moment or a challenging situation that you encountered, maybe in addition to the screwdriver incident? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to check out that chat, chat GPT. I don't know where that one came from. Um, yeah, probably the most spectacular visual I ever had and may ever have is on the Hubble service mission our plan was to roll up the solar arrays and bring them back to Earth and install some new ones. So these solar arrays had a problem when it went from dark to light and they warmed up. Maybe it was the other way around. They would get this stick-slip phenomenon going on. So they would build up a pressure as they expanded and then it would release. And that caused the whole telescope to jitter and they would lose lock on whatever it is they were observing. And so these new solar arrays were pretty much the same design, only they had like bed springs in them, so there was no stick slip. There was a constant ability to expand or contract. Um, and then some insulations around the, the bi stems. But um, one of them refused to roll up. There was an issue with it. We could see it um, and expected that to be the case. And so we knew we were going to have to throw that one away. So I was on the end of the mechanical arm, and I had a, my hands on it, and my partner Tom was disconnecting it from the telescope, which we had to do in darkness because we didn't want to break a hot connection. Uh, but we wanted to release it in daylight so that we could see where it was going relative to us, be sure we separated. And so I was just hanging out there on this thing, and when the time came to deploy, I just took my hands off of it. I didn't push it. I just let it go, and uh, Claude Nicolier, who was our arm operator, pulled me back away from it, and then the pilot Ken Bowersox fired the jets on the orbiter to move us away, to separate from it. And the jet plumes hit this thing, and it just sort of bent over and then flapped back. And it was this giant, I'm trying to think how big these are. I'm, I'm guessing 20 feet on a side, so maybe 40 foot long thing out there. And it was just cruising and diving over the deserts in the Middle East, which is an incredibly beautiful part of the world to fly over. And I remember the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden. It was like this pterodactyl out there just cruising over the deserts. And uh, we watched it for a while. It was mesmerizing. And then we had to get back to work, back to business. So you mentioned uh, your kids. Uh, 
which means you raised a family while going through all of this. So how did you manage the work-life balance and what support systems were crucial during Okay, all of this? are we disclosing our relationship I here? I mean, half the audience knows. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my oldest daughter. <laughs> so we're gonna get her perspective here in a minute and I'll probably learn some things I don't even know. Um, it, you know, it's like any job where you, you have um, travel, um, unpredictable hours, that sort of thing. It's certainly not unique to being an astronaut. But I think you just you just do the best you can. You 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 know pay attention to what's most important at the moment to do, and um, depended a lot on non-working mothers. God bless them all who helped me take care of Girl Scouts and softball practice and all that kind of stuff when I couldn't be there. Um, counted on my kids to be probably more independent than most kids are now. There was a one time, and I don't know if you remember this, I was in a simulator. So before a flight, you get in a simulator and you have the, the um, trainers are off in another station and they give you all kinds of failures that you have to deal with and whatnot. So my whole crew is in the simulator um, and I get this call from the instructor station and they said, you need to, go home. You need to call home now. I thought, oh my God, something horrible has happened. It was before cell phones, so I had to get out, go somewhere, and find a phone and call home. And I, what do I get? I get, Mom, how many cans of tomatoes do you put in pot roast? <laughs> it was either you or Laura. I'm not sure who. I don't think that was me. I don't um, so, <laughs> yeah, This is true. <laughs> then this could be the reason you don't cook. So, so, what do you, so what do you do? You, know, you can't scream at him and go, I'm busy. How can you do this? I congratulated you or Laura on cooking. Thank you so much for starting dinner. You're so wonderful. And then we discussed the recipe for pot roast. <laughs> And then I went back to the simulator and said, why don't you guys get calls like this? <laughs> why is it just me? Yeah, that was definitely not me. <laughs> I've never attempted pot roast in my life. Well, so, yeah, you just, you just do the best you can. Do the best you can. Uh, ask for help. Accept help. So from your perspective, being one of not too many astrotots of that time, um, you know, I'm sure that you guys wished I was home baking brownies instead of flying jets around the country. So what's your perspective on that? I mean, I don't know that I remember, um, I mean, the long periods of time would be when you would, uh, getting ready to launch, right? So there's two week quarantine ahead of time. One week. Okay. May have seemed like two weeks, but it was only. Oh, okay. Well, there's <laughs> See, there's her perspective hit, right hit there. Time right? <laughs> um, so I remember the, the quarantines and then if the shuttle, if the mission got delayed for whatever reason, that of course extended it. And there was, I think it was the last year where it was a month or mm -hmm. more. I was in quarantine for over a month. Yeah. You had to petition to get me to pass eighth grade. Yes. Um, missed too many days in school. too many days in the school system. And they say, all right, you missed too many days. You don't get to go on. Well, I did all the work. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so that was another piece. So, I mean, those are the ones that I really remember, but what you got to miss was all the parties. <laughs> this is true. Oh, yeah, the family reunions. I'm sure they were wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I saw far more family during those. She knows more of my cousins than I do. <laughs> Potentially. Um, family that we didn't get to see that often um, in Alabama and North Carolina that didn't live near us and we didn't travel to them very often. They would all go to Florida for these launches. So that really was the time that I got to meet or spend time with a lot of family. Um, kids from school would get invited and come. So I would have like some of my friends there too. I mean, if it, if it got delayed and it was only a delayed by a day or two, then we got to have fun. Go to so, Disneyland. Yeah, and, the beach. Yeah. It was lovely. Um, but when they start to add up, then that's of course, that's of course different. But I don't remember um, feeling any particular way about it other than that's the way it was and this is the job and had things had you stayed and, and um, had to train for the ISS, for the International Space Station? I mean, I know that that would have been a very different scenario. Um, and that probably played a role. In, that is a factor in, in why I decided it was time. Yeah. For sure. As a teenager, I didn't understand. I was very unhappy. But as an adult, there's, you can understand a lot more. Yeah, it's, it's um, I would say it's a selfish profession because it was great for me, but a lot of times it's not great for the family. But then, you know, how's that different than being a firefighter, a police officer, or military? You know, it's other people deal with that as well. The, you know, the the risk and the 
worry and all that stuff. And it was um, limited to certain periods of time, right? So I think that played a role there too. It mm -hmm. wasn't as frequent as, say, a firefighter or a police officer. It's true. And they, um, at launch time, they would take our immediate family and put them, they would be on the launch con top of the launch control center so that they would, if anything happened, be sequestered. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people think it's, you know, all champagne and caviar and stuff like that, but it's not. You know, it's hugs and tears and that kind of stuff up there. Yeah, I remember from the, the first mission was the first night launch after the Challenger incident. And so it was sort of a big deal um, because they wouldn't be able to see, or at least I think it was the first one, one of the first at least. I think you're right. I'd forgotten about that. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that's what I was told. So I've been repeating it ever since. Um, uh, but it meant that it was the first uh, night one where they couldn't see everything because it's dark. And so that was a big deal. I remember a lot of talk from the adults around around that particular piece. And I think I was the only one old enough to really have any idea of what that meant. Laura was far too young at that point, and Susan didn't exist yet, so that, that helps. But uh, so that, I think, had a, a higher level of anxiety for me, both being the first, and I could tell that the adults were nervous. Mm -hmm. um, but once it went, I mean, that at that point in time, it was just getting up. And then mm -hmm. everything was going to be okay. Yeah. It's also one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life is a night launch. Um, it's like the sun rising instantaneously. It's like the most beautiful sunrise you've ever seen. I've never seen one, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> no, you only got to see day launches. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's something that is completely unforgettable. All right. So getting back to, to some of our questions, um, what inspired you to become an astronaut? How did you go from physicist to astronaut? And how do you inspire people today to pursue careers in space exploration and science? Well, I mean, I would say the first thing is I got incredibly lucky. It's, anybody thinks that they deserve it is just wrong. I, I got lucky. I was um, working as a physicist for the US Army at an intelligence place and I saw an announcement that NASA was selecting their next group and I don't think I would have seen it even though I guess it was published somewhere but I don't think I would have seen it except through these army channels because I have never seen an announcement that NASA is selecting the next group so um, anyway I saw it and I thought you know all they do is say no you know they don't shoot you they don't eat you or anything they just say yes or no and until they say no the dream is alive so I applied pretty much on a lark which, you know, really disturbs some people who put their whole lives into trying to do this. You know, how can that happen? But, you know, it does. You, know, you, you don't get something you don't ask for. Um, and even if it was totally ridiculously low probability event, like, so what? What? So I applied on a lark. And um, surprisingly enough, they called. Uh, my husband was a professor at the University of Virginia, and he was not in the least bit interested in moving to Houston, ever. So I it never did. But never did. 12 yeah. years we spent in Houston. Yeah, so my two-year-old and I went to Houston. So I'm down there as a de facto single mother with a two-year-old in this crazy job that has unbelievable hours and un unpredictable hours, I would say. And one of the things we had to do was um, get flight time. So fly. I'd never been in anything other than an airliner. So I get down there within a week or maybe two weeks. I'm in this backseat of this T-38, which is a two-seat supersonic jet trainer. And uh, on the on the runway, you know, an afterburner <laughs> taken off, but but they were um, I wouldn't say they're unreliable, but uh, there were a number of things that could ground it. So you go somewhere to get your flight hours, and you land in say Amarillo, Texas, and then something doesn't check out on takeoff, and you have to ground the airplane, find your own way home, which may not be that day. So I remember taking her to daycare and asking, "What happens if at five o'clock I like don't come back?" <laughs> and they just looked at me and said, "You're not going to do that, are you?" <laughs> So, you I mean, you have to have plan A, plan B, plan C, you know, to make sure that everything gets taken care of. And on another occasion, um, where I, I had to ask for help, was um, we went to the emergency room to get her head stitched up after she <laughs> the scar. cut it open. And I had my other two girls with me. And so, what do you do? I got this nine-year-old in the treatment room getting stitches in her head. And I got two other younger kids out in the, in the waiting room doing who knows what. 
So I would be going back and forth. And I went out one time, and Laura, who was probably seven or eight, was sitting reading a book. She was perfectly fine. And my three-year-old was putting crayons in electrical outlets. <laughs> so I call up my friend, my non-working mother friend, who turned out eventually to be a general in the Air Force Reserves after a while. But at that point, she was non-working. Please, please, come, come get my kids. So she did. She came rescue the younger two so I could stay with her while she got her head stitched up. So um, just any number of those anecdotes of, of how we just barely squeak by in terms of child protective services <laughs> and uh, surviving it. But, but I have to say, you know, all my kids have grown up to be very independent, very successful. Uh, there was no helicopter parenting on their part. I mean, for, for them, it didn't exist at that time, but it certainly wasn't, you know, they were, they had to be strong. And he never tried to teach me to use the weed whacker again. Yeah. So um, I have to, in my defense, in my defense, I had gone, it was a Saturday morning, I had gone to a conference about something about girls in science or engineering or something like that. And as I was driving home, I, it occurred to me, I'm about to pay this young girl who's just babysat my three kids for most of a day, the same amount I pay this kid who mows my lawn, it takes him an hour. Now that isn't right. So I can't change the economy, but I, I do want my kids to have a choice. I don't care if they never mow a lawn for a living, but they need to have a choice. So that was the reason for getting out the weed whacker, which ended up in the emergency room and crayons in the outlet. So my intentions were good. <laughs> sure. All right. So uh, one of the things that you've alluded to is, is both teamwork and collaboration, both uh, inside and outside of the office, we'll, we'll say. So how did you build trust and effective communication with your crew during missions? And what leadership lessons can you pass on to our students here based on those experiences? I'll tell you one thing I think that NASA excels at, and, and at least in that time frame and probably now, is um, everybody knows what the mission is. And we're all pointed in the direction of the mission. We may have different ideas of how to get there and what's the right path to take. And we would have these meetings before a flight um, where we came up with flight rules. And flight rules are, what do you do if this thing happens? So this unit fails, the flight rules you go through say, do this. So that you don't have to have that discussion in real time. Because um, this, this thing that failed may involve several different systems. So you may have you know, 30 people who need to be consulted. So all that's thought out ahead of time. So we would have these meetings that would get just knocked down, drag out, hollering each other across the table. And then at the end of the day, everybody goes out and gets a beer together. You know, it's not personal. It, it's the job, it's the mission, and, and you have to respect that everybody in that room is trying to get to the same place. And so I think if you can separate um, that from personal stuff, you know, and it, when I went to academia, that was the thing that struck me the most, is for a lot of people, not a lot of people, for some people, if I don't like your idea, I don't like you because it's personal, but it's not. It's really not. And I think if you can make that separation, and if you can, um, you can, you can accomplish a lot as a team if you don't care who gets credit. In a lot of ways, academia has built the antithesis of that, that you have to get credit, because that's your promotion, that's your track. Um, and, and I guess it has to be that way, just by the nature of the business. But, but that came as a real surprise to me, um, that, that credit, you know, first author, you know, all this stuff makes it makes a huge difference here. It makes a huge difference for you guys when you get out. If you're going in academia, so I mean, you can't ignore it, but um, you cannot take it too seriously. So I probably just made some enemies here, but you know, that's my experience crossing crossing from uh, NASA world to or aerospace world to, to something else. All right. Do we have any questions from the audience now? I think we're going to get a mic for the. Well, I'll, I'll just repeat it. So we'll start with you. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, how did I feel? Because my first flight was um, so it was soon after return to flight after Challenger. So I think the first return to flight was in September of 88, and I flew in November of 89. So it was just maybe six flights later. 
Um, you know, and those of us in the program knew that somebody was going to get hurt. Space is a dangerous business, and, and somebody's still going to get hurt. You know, SpaceX is flying, everything's going great now, but, you know, but, but I think astronauts are pretty good at denial. Somebody's going to get hurt, but not me and not today, <laughs> sort of thing. The hardest thing before launch is to say goodbye to your family, particularly the kids. So um, within a week of flight, we had to go into a semi-quarantine. We couldn't see our children under 16 because everyone knows that they're infectious little beasts and contact with them is certain death. Uh, but we could see our spouses, some of whom were teachers who hung around with those little kids or doctors who made a living, you know, hanging around with sick people. So I never quite understood it, but um, I never broke quarantine. So you separate that out. You can see your spouse up till like the day before. Um, but that's the hard part. After that, it was almost like being on autopilot, just like watching myself do it. Let's just light this thing and see what happens. If you ever see somebody go out to the, the hatch and not climb in and say, wait, I changed my mind, that's the bravest person in the world because once you're on this train, you're just going where it's taking you. I think I saw another hand back there. We've got a mic now. Uh, hello. Oh, it's for yeah, Zoom. It's for Zoom. Zoom. Thank you. Um, so my question is, how does it feel like returning back from Earth? Um, uh, during your during your uh, space escapades because like i'm very curious about that like where did you guys like typically land and how did it feel to just like just be returning to earth and stuff like that yeah on uh entry after the deorbit burn there's a period of cruise for a little while until you start coming into the atmosphere so it's the atmosphere that slows you down and that's what you perceive as gravity is the deceleration from coming into the atmosphere so it comes on kind of slowly if you have uh, you know, your pen and it's tied on with a lanyard, you'll see it sort of drifting down. It's kind of fun to look at. Um, you feel about twice or three times as heavy as you normally would because you're, you've learned over the course of several days or weeks to, you know, if I want to move my arm from here to here, I know my brain knows how many you know, muscle fibers have to fire to make this happen normally. But in orbit, it's like you know, next to nothing. And so you're coming in and you're starting to feel gravity. And, you know, just to lift your arms is so heavy. I had a little video camera at one time and I had to, in this hand, I was like, <laughs> I had to keep pushing it back up because I couldn't hold it up. It was just so heavy. It probably weighed half a pound. Um, so that comes on kind of slowly. The neurovestibular stuff is um, if, if you're not on the flight deck, so I was on the, on the mid deck for some of my entries. Um, you don't have anything to do. You're looking at the lockers. The view never changes. And so you can kind of play with that stuff going on in your head. You can close your eyes and bend over. You will swear somebody pulled your seat backwards. And then you get the giggles. <laughs> um, yeah. And where did we land? So um, I think I landed twice at Edwards Air Force Base and twice at the Kennedy Space Center. So the goal was always to bring the shuttle back to the Kennedy Space Center. That's its home port. That's the people who work on it, it's their spaceship. Uh, we would go to Edwards if there was some reason. So one time um, they were resurfacing the runway at Kennedy for my first flight. So we landed at Edwards. And for my second flight, it was the first flight of the Space Shuttle Endeavor. And so for the return of a new vehicle, they wanted to be at the lake bed in Edwards because you have a lot of latitude if it were to depart the runway. Um, in Florida, there's a runway, and it's surrounded by moats, and there's alligators in there. You do not want to leave the runway in Florida. So there's a lot more latitude in, in Edwards. So that's where we went. We had a question over here, I think. Hello. Hi. My question is, when you're in the spacewalk and you're outside of the spaceship, what pulls you more? The want, the the intrigued of earth or the wonder of looking up above you and wondering what's out there um actually the overarching thing is i got to get this work done and time is going by so fast honest to goodness um when people stick their head out of the hatch for the first time the doctors see heart rates going up it's not because they're afraid of getting hurt or the wonder of the universe it's uh, please god don't let me screw up really um you know when you're when you have light around you, so the daylight passes, or if you have lights on, you can't see the stars. It's like, you know, here when there's light, you can't see it. Um, and you get very little chance even to look at the earth because you are heads down into whatever your work site is. So it's, it's rare occasions when you get to 
to enjoy that you are out there. And there was one time when I was on the end of the mechanical arm and I was being moved from one position to another. And that's a slow process. I was working on putting the right sockets on the tools for the next whatever thing I had to do. And the guy said, you got to look out there. You know, stop what you're doing and look out there. And we were, it was the, it was the Hubble mission because that's the highest the shuttle has flown. So it's a pretty high altitude flight, relatively speaking. Um, and we were over the Gulf of Mexico and I could see the west coast of the United States and the east coast of the United States and Aurora up over Canada, all in one view. And it was spectacular. So that's one of the few times I remember having an opportunity to look back at Earth. There was one other time when we were doing this um, experiment on how not to build space stations. So one of the early designs of space station was like tinker toys. It was like sticks and balls, which is more efficient to launch because you're not launching a bunch of airspace in there. Uh, but it was going to take a bazillion hours of space walking time. So they pretty much arrived at that conclusion before our flight, and we were hoping they didn't pull the experiment off because we wanted to do a spacewalk. And so we did that. So we were out there, and I was climbing one of these poles, and there's a lot of flexibility in these things. It's like you know, a diving board. And I get to the top of it, and I could see the earth going by underneath me, and that, that gave me the sensation that I was falling. Because it looked, I thought I was doing a tumble forward or backwards. I can't remember which it was. But um, yeah, that was kind of a unique sensation up there. I mean, you know you're not. You're not moving at all relative to the orbiter, and you don't have any sensation of speed at all. It's the Earth is turning in front of you, but it's like you're not even moving because there's no wind, there's no you know, vibrations, there's none of the things we recognize as speed. Um, yeah, there's a few times when it, your brain kind of messes with you. There's a question. Oh. You guys are so polite. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, you'll have to speak up a little bit for us. Okay. That's for the, the Zoom people. Okay, so um, my question was, you've expressed how difficult it was to spend time with your kids and spend that time apart. Um, basically, if you were given the opportunity to like redo things over and do it again, would you? I think I would. I, I think that, you know, a, a lot of, I would say, a lot of the, your experiences and how they turned out was because of that. You know, and I, I wouldn't want to change any of that because I kind of like who they are. Um, I, I tell you, I didn't go anywhere or do anything. If it wasn't work-related, I didn't go anywhere or do anything without them, pretty much. I mean, I had, they've been in bars. They've been in, <laughs> I had a photo I'm pumping. Okay. It was Texas, y'all. <laughs> it was Texas. It was Texas. But, yeah, I mean, I, you know, if I wasn't working, I was with them because I wanted to be. I went to as many softball games and swim meets as I could. I was a timer at swim meets, which is a terrible job, but I did it. Um, what else? I was a cookie mom for two Girl Scout troops. Had to pay for what they pilfered in the house. <laughs> so earlier was discussed how you talked about, um, there was discussion of you getting involved with, you know, climate change. How did you come to care about that? I think chat GPT did that for me. <laughs> <laughs> I do care about it. I mean, I, I have seen it. Where, where we live in Virginia, there were years ago when I was a graduate student there, I ice skated on the reservoir, which is a stupid thing to do, but I did it. We haven't had snow in three years. We haven't even had a, even a shimmer of ice on those water, bodies of water in years. So I can see it changing, and it's, um, we have to stop it as much as we can and adapt to it in the sense that we can't. Can you use that for the Zoom? Yeah. Meeting? From the moment you got your call back, what was the hiring process like at, at NASA? And, and, and how long did it take from the moment you got the call back to the moment they offered you a position? Um, so I think the deadline for the applications was like October of 1983. So it was kind of fire and forget. I sent it in, but I'll never hear from these people. And then in March, they called and said, um, you want to come down for an interview? Next week. And I said, well, I got a ski trip plan. Can it be the next week? I was stupid. I wasn't. I had no idea. Can you, can you do it like the next week? Oh, okay. We can do it the next week. So um, they interviewed groups of 20. So they had about six weeks of interviews. And the week-long process was mostly medical tests. 
um, and then an interview with a psychologist and a psychiatrist and the interview board. So um, <laughs> I was an idiot. So I, um, I think I told the psychologist that we had to do these written tests. You know, if you were an animal, what animal would you be? It's a rabbit and a beaver. You know, I said, I think I can make you think whatever you want. He goes, no, you can't. <laughs> okay. Um, and then there was one test they did where they were looking for, um, no, they were looking for evidence of possible epilepsy or seizures. And so they instrumented your head and they put it in a kind of a semi-drugged, half-asleep state and then startle you. And somehow they were supposed to learn something from that. Well, I went directly from that to the interview with the board and I was stoned. <laughs> I was way more talkative than I normally am. Uh, and uninhibited, so it was a great interview, I guess. But but they got to the end of it, and uh, and they said, We're, "Do you have any questions for us?" And um, knowing them, you know, if I'd ever got my husband to move to Houston, I would never do this to him again. So I said, "Yeah, what do you do when you're like 55 years old and you're too young for Social Security and too old to be an astronaut?" And John Young, like walked on the moon. John Young looked up with his glasses on the end of his nose. He says, I don't know, but I'll tell you next year. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm not going to see Houston again. <laughs> but I met some interesting people. It was a great worthwhile experience. I met the other 19 people in my group, and thought some of them were going to make great astronauts. And there's a couple more stories of that. Maybe I'll save for later <laughs> about riding a chicken and <laughs> stuff like that. But, um, yeah. So they that was the interview, and then I thought, I'll never see these people again. And then... The end of May, which actually was our fifth anniversary, and they called up and said, hey, you want to come to Houston? So I said, can I think about it? <laughs> um, but I can't. All right, I think we have our last question. Okay, well, happy Women's Month. And um, I actually wanted to ask you a question regarding uh, women and girls. So my question is, how do you think the inclusion of more female astronauts will impact the future of space exploration and inspire the next generation of girls to pursue careers in STEM? You know, when you talk about it, it bringing people into the STEM fields, now there's two ways you can do it. One is you can start with young kids and you can push them toward it. The other is you can pull them from the other end with the promise of uh, fulfilling and interesting careers. So I think the fact that there are more women, the percentage of women I think is going up, some of that has to do with the fact that we are not flying anything with wings. And so military test pilot is no longer a factor or as much of a factor as it was. And that's a huge filter for keeping other people out, women out. But, um, you know, as I said, you have to value people for what they bring to the table, what they bring. So, you know, women astronauts are just like male astronauts, except we're smaller, we eat less, and we take up less space. Fly more women. Yeah, for sure. There was a paper written that said women are the ideal people to go to Mars. It had to do with our our um, hearts and a few other things that, that we would be the ideal candidates. So pass that on. As we conclude our event, let us carry forward the inspiration and insights shared by Dr. Catherine C. Thornton. Her remarkable journey in the field of science serves as a beacon of empowerment and achievement for all. Let's continue to honor the contributions of women in STEM and strive to create an inclusive and equitable environment where everyone can thrive. Thank you, Dr. C. Thornton, Dr. Carol Hood, Dean Sastry G. Pantilla, and the CNS staff for making this event possible. Thank you for joining us in this meaningful dialogue and we look forward to continuing the conversation in our ongoing pursuit of excellence within the college of natural sciences <laughs>